Well, welcome uh, Resonate Watchers. We're really thrilled and excited. I'm so excited to introduce to you today, Phil Barnard, who's the regional team leader of the London Baptists. And um, Phil and I have been growing conversation um, as I've been getting to know him. Uh, and I, I'm got invited to speak at the Baptist uh, gathering, uh, London Baptist gathering in March last year. Uh, which was, I, you know, I didn't realize quite what a, an honor that was until um, I was there and I realized I was probably the only person who was a vaguely outsider um, figure in relation to the lineup. <laughs> um, and, uh, no, but I am a Baptist, all right? Just so if anybody doesn't know it, we are, I have been leading a church in, in Campbell, Peckham. Uh, uh, for the last 30 years, that is a Baptist building, and so I have been an honorary Baptist minister. Is that right, Phil? Am I, would I be accepted? Yeah, no, it's funny, you know, I mean, it was two years ago, Phil, that's the thing, because uh, we didn't have a conference oh, no, last no. year. <laughs> um, well, did we? Lockdown. <laughs> that's what it's done for no, us. No, we did, we did. It's other things that didn't happen last year. It was last year, because you just yeah. think, when was, when was this? Gosh, what were we? Oh, it was February. It was before the, before the first lockdown. It was, yeah, it was this before. year we couldn't do it. So, right. yeah. Um, no, uh, yes, you are. Yeah, no, you're part of our family. Um, I mean, I know you're not a, a, an accredited minister, as we call it, but you've been probably part of our setup for longer than most of the people who who have become mm. ordained in the Baptist Union and, and obviously you're very well known to us. And it was good to have you with us at that conference, actually. It was, it was really great for people to meet you. It was an enjoyable conference. And I have to say, you know, there's a lot of talk of, of mission and development um, and uh, a lot of stimulating input from all sorts of tremendous folk. And I was learning a lot as well uh, just to be there. It was just a great environment. So, um, and it was great to see you uh, in action, Phil, leading and uh, sharing that, leading it through. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, listeners an opportunity to, to meet you, really, to hear you. Uh, if, uh, if, if they may be within the Baptist circles and know you anyway, they may, may not be, because that's the nature of reach. We're uh, kind of a multi-denominational connection of, of uh, all sorts of renegades and vagabonds. <laughs> malcontents and what have you but we're uh, we're great we're grateful to hear from anyone who is in leadership in london and wrestling with what it looks like to do mission uh today in this culture so phil tell us a bit about yourself where what's your story why are you here how did you get to to be leading the baptists in london well thanks phil and it, it's good to to be able to share with you and to share with your your listeners, your subscribers, as it were. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I've been in sort of church-based ministry now for, well, it'll be 21 years this year. Shock horror. I started uh, as, a, as a very raw graduate of what was then called London Bible College in the, the turn of the millennium, 2000, graduated then. Um, before that, um, I used to have, oh, I grew up in, in uh, Sutton and Cheen, so I've always seen myself as kind of a, a London person. Um, you know, my, my dad actually had a job at King's College Hospital when we were growing up in Sutton, so we'd often drive up to Camberwell. Yeah. My grandfather had a business in Tooting. Um, yeah, we, we lived in Sutton in the 70s, Cheen in the 80s. Um, I grew up in church background, um, Baptist. I was at North Cheen Baptist Church in the 70s. Yeah. David Coffey was the pastor then, he went on to be general secretary. And then um, later we moved to Cheam, um, in Cheam Village, and was there for quite a long time. Um, I guess sort of from a from a work and faith point of view, I mean, obviously I, I, I became a, I was baptised when I was 15, but then wandered a bit when I went to work. And then I, I had what I like to think my second conversion. I realised that being a Christian isn't about just sitting and being pew fodder mm. and we had pews mm. and actually it was about what you were doing to mm. the Lord and that was when I was 21, 22 and then after that it kind of went on from there. I was working for WH Smith which is what I did when I left school, didn't go to university, got made redundant from Smith's in the, in the early 90s, mm. ended up in Christian bookselling. I was okay. the Christian bookseller in Sutton, some of your 
subscribers may have even come into my shop who knows but um i was there for a few years and then we got taken over by wesley owen mm. which kind of was a bit of a crisis moment for me really because it it was my baby and it had it was taken away from me by a very big corporation and uh you know we were doing all sorts of interesting things and um you know events and authors stuff and mm. and so i thought well what am i going to do so I, I actually went to study Mm-hmm. So I went and studied theology at LBC, uh, did quite a lot of music there as well, did the music major, but it was through my time there that... What what made you think going to, to do theology at that stage then? Why did you do that? Well, I guess I thought... Uh, well, I, I thought... This background you know, in really... retail, and then you, you kind of d- took a, a completely new direction, yeah? Yeah, well, I guess I was thinking, well, I need to get more education. I need to think, what am I going to do next? I didn't see myself staying in retail management, although I did quite enjoy it. Um, I thought, well, maybe I should go and work in publishing. Maybe I could I could work in a parachurch kind of setting or you know, maybe something else entirely. Um, mm. My then girlfriend also wanted to train as a missionary as mm. well. And she was going to go. I know that sounds like a terribly unspiritual thing to say. It probably does sound very unspiritual, but she was going. Mm. I went along and thought, well, I'll apply. Mm. I was a bit annoyed they didn't grill me, actually. I was kind of thinking, I was hoping for them to really give me the kind of third degree. Why do you want to come here? Mm. And uh, they didn't. (laughs) I just sort of talked about myself and Mm. my faith and my life. And they said, oh, yeah, okay, then. And I thought, yeah, oh. yeah. and then only later I realised that colleges are desperate for students. <laughs> so, so I went there, mm. and I did the music major. I did Christian life and ministry, the clan course. Um, it was always a bit of a, a joke amongst the the other course. They thought we were the one with the colouring pencils. You know, we were <laughs> we were kind of much more about practical. But that's very me. Uh, I do love theology, and I learned a huge amount at LBC. It was transformative for my life, really. Um, Absolutely brilliant time there. Um, And it was during my sort of second and third year when I did a placement in a local church, which met in a school, because I couldn't really relate to the ministry which I was experiencing at Cheam. Not to say I didn't love the people there, not to say I didn't appreciate the pastors there, but it was quite a style of ministry which was quite straight laced. You know, I was a musician, a worship leader. They are still and uh, you know a very conservative church they're in the FIEC um, you know I appreciated the bible teaching but I, I the style of ministry there didn't really resonate with me in mm. fact I remember my then pastor telling me one day Phil you'll grow out of playing the drums <laughs> I haven't I haven't <laughs> so I still don't and um, you know and so I, I went to college I, I ended up in this placement church which was an Anglican church plant meeting in a school being led by a salvationist Mm. who'd been Uh, in the college as well and um yeah really interesting and it was from that kind of roll your sleeves up church plant type thing where you had to put your chairs out you you know it it was very it was much more of a local community rather than a destination church that i thought actually and i started to do a bit more preaching which i hadn't done much of people said to me phil you should think about the, the pastorate and i went yeah right and then to cut a long story short i was in my third year and i applied for a job on the jobs board at hartford baptist church i hadn't done any accreditation or ministerial formation that you would have done at spurgeon's i preached probably less than 10 times in my life Mm. and i went for an interview and i got on very well with the senior minister there david Mm. who's now retired um and it went from there and i ended up preaching with a view as they call it in our world mm. for the associate ministry assistant ministry there and ended up going there so that back and so up. yeah and so that's how i ended up in there i spent five years there mm. and then i moved to london um I, I got married while i was at hartford not to the girl i went to bible college with that's a story for another day um but i i married jen um and then we moved to Mitcham Lane in Streatham in 2006. And I spent 10 years there and I came into this role five years ago this summer. Mm. And how, five years ago, so you've been in position five years. What, what yeah. was the 
So tell us a little bit about those five years in leadership in, in the London Baptists. You've been in that role and um, I, your, your name came to my attention fairly early on, I think, really, that um, there's this new uh, um, a, a new leader of the Baptists in, in, in London. And it, mm. uh, although I wasn't attending a lot of Baptist of gatherings, uh, there, was a, there was a bit of a, uh, I, I remember hearing, this guy's shaking it up a little bit. So just tell me a little bit about what you were doing that, that was shaking up the Baptists in, uh, if from, from five years ago up to today. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a, uh, uh, it's been an, in, in, an, an experience. I mean, mm. the association, the London Baptist Association, that's what we are legally, uh, even though we're called London Baptist now, um, has been around since 1865. Hmm. And this role that I hold, which used to be the Metropolitan Superintendent, used to go to people who were in the last few years before their retirement. It's quite a senior role. There's a lot of churches in London, um, 300 as part of the, the association, which is by far the largest in the country. We're very strong in London, hmm. very strong in the southeast generally in terms of Baptist life. Um, and... I, want I guess to, really, I think I'll come back to that in a minute because, in terms of the history of the Baptist, yeah. it's quite an important. Oh, it is, yeah, very significant. Yeah, I mean, we'll come. Yeah, we'll come back to that. But mm. I mean, I guess one of the reasons why I applied for the role mm. is that I was a minister in London for ten years, and I saw that there was a deep need for there to be a reconnecting mm. with the local church from the broader Baptist family. Now, I say this with all due respect to people who've led the association before, people who've been involved, but I have a managerial background. You know, as I said, I was a retail manager. In fact, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my leadership and managerial skills, because they, you know, in, in a way, when you leave Bible college, you think I'm ready. But actually, it's it's those people skills you really need. Absolutely. So I, go on, background. did you want to say something? Yes. So I just, as you're sharing, I'm just thinking that that phrase reconnect with the community yeah you know, explain that yeah so i mean we've become quite distant from the churches there were some who we obviously had a reasonable relationship with but i remember visiting one of the churches early in my time mm. and it was a fairly large church on the outside of london and they'd cut our funding because they said we never know what you're doing Okay, so the central, the central body of um, the, le the kind of leadership of the London Baptists had become distanced from the rest of the... Yeah, Baptists. I think so. I think obviously there were other things they focused on. But mm. for me, it's all about the local church and how, and indeed our new, our new brand identity about help, helping local churches thrive. Mm. You know, we are there to serve and equip and advise and guide and be a sounding board and inspire people in the local community. Because what Baptists really are is a bottom-up movement. They're not a top-down movement. Mm. You know, mm. when we're at our best, mm. we're about the local church. Mm. When we lose our way, I think is when we start trying to pronounce what we should all do from the centre. Now, there are some things we have to do, mm. because all of us have to do it, regarding compliance and whatnot, safeguarding the rest of it. Does that independent kind of um, culture come from a sort of a, a, an Anabaptist kind of history? Is it? Is it rooted in? Well, the way, not the yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's our background. I mean I, I mean, I don't know how much people listening to this, watching this. I, I'm not going to assume kind of, anything. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, the Baptists come out of the Radical Reformation. So basically, we came about in the sort of you know 16th century around then, maybe before. Um, of people who felt that the Reformation in Europe and in this country, particularly this country, hadn't gone far enough. And that really the, ch the state church, which had gone through the Protestant Reformation, really just wanted to replace the Pope with a different set of leaders. Mm. You mm. know, and, and I mean, Henry VIII, as we know, in this country just wanted to be Pope. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a theological reformation. It was in part, but it wasn't really a, a social revolution Mm. to the extent that some of those early radicals wanted to see. They wanted to cast off mm. the, the, the shackles of the state to gather and study and worship together. And that was a dangerous game back then, as I'm mm. sure you know. People got 
Absolutely. Persecuted and killed for it. You, you yeah. weren't allowed to not be part of the church. <laughs> and um, and so we came about, and that's about the local. So we've always been about the, the gathered community coming mm. together to study, mm. to, to worship, to discern so, what the Lord is saying to the local people. Yeah, so essentially it's sort of a quite egalitarian local yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. theology of, of people discerning what God's doing and saying and trying to do it locally is that that's it yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. more or less yeah i mean i think that that that, that relationship with uh with, you know placing it in church history i think is quite useful helpful for for folk because there's so many strands uh around today and there are a lot of people just going well one church is as good as another and you said something when we were talking about it before you're saying that so much of what has got god has done in recent years is that has led to the charismaticizing of of most of the mainstream churches so you can drift from one type of church to another and they can often seem the same on the surface is that right yeah i mean that's very true i mean obviously there are differences there from mm. from different streams different different cultural expressions of church but certainly from a white kind of church perspective mm. um there has been a, a charismaticizing of the mainstream Mm. Uh, and, and of course, for a lot of that we can look to through the effect of Alpha mm. and Spring Harvest and Soul Survivor and all of those things. Mm. So you might go to a, a charismatic Anglican church or a, or a house church, one that came from the house church or, mm. or even quite a few Baptist churches. And you mm. think, well, the language, the theology. I mean, John Wimber was a big effect as well yeah. in yeah. this country um you know you look at it and you think actually there's a common currency there to a large degree and well, that, i think that, that came out as well the worship styles as well that that, that yeah. it seems to have been adopted by so many charismatic oh. churches so your yeah, vineyard worship was so big wasn't it back in the 80s and 90s and and then he'll yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean worship i mean as a musician you know worship music i mean i've got all my my books back here but you know when you look at songs of fellowship you can almost trace the the contemporary evangel evangelical sort of charismatic history of the church. And mm. I once went to one church in East London, and it was quite funny. I was preaching, and and there was this wonderful kind of object lesson to my left. They had a long shelf mm. that had the whole history of worship music <laughs> right along, and it was almost in chronological order. I'm surprised yeah. they didn't have stuff on Latin at the yeah. start. Yeah. But it, and I said to the people, I said, where do you locate yourself on that spectrum? You know, are you a book one, book two? Maybe you were spring, streams of living water. <laughs> Maybe you were youth praise. Depends what you know, and, and, uh, you're a boomer, then yeah, definitely. Um, well, I'm, an, I'm an Xer, so. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, so Phil, this is, I mean, in terms of the, the whole development of the church um what what's kind of ha what's on your heart at the moment how are you um you know what what are the things that are energizing you how have you kind of kept things moving in the baptist movement uh, in london well there's a lot of exciting things happening and i mean you know you've you've heard that you've seen that in fact one of my most encouraging conversations was with you actually phil you might not remember it we bumped into each other at the standing together thing and you you said we're hearing really good things about the Baptists. We're going to go to Baptist assembly. I have to say, not many people have ever said that to me before. <laughs> and I thought, brilliant. <laughs> and actually, that is really good. And there is some really good things that are happening nationally and in London. Um, and, and a lot of good, good on the ground, creative, missional expressions of church lots of things in london too and you know mm. that that for me brings me a lot of joy a lot of our small churches mm. um they've actually perhaps even been more flexible during the pandemic than the mm. larger churches mm. uh, that's a subject perhaps separate to this but you know certainly all of that is is great to see i mean mm. i guess one of the big preoccupations for me is life after covid what's it going to look like and i think we're all wrestling with that yeah and i don't think we know uh, to a large extent the longer term yeah. aspects of this but certainly in terms of things that um energize me i mean one of the things i would say that i think we were talking about before you know and, and i think this 
I think COVID is going to act as a catalyst on this, is, is how we see churches overcome the, the baggage and weight of the legacy of the past to mm. step into a new phase of ministry. Mm. You know, I, it's something that I've been thinking about for ever since I came into the, the ministry, really. Um, you know, when you look at denominations and how they're created, they get stuck. Mm. And there is maybe there's a move of God. Mm. And and then that is institutionalized forever in a day. And woe betide the person mm. who were to confront that or challenge that and say, mm. perhaps you need to look for something else. And I think mm. that all churches in this country, regardless mm. of the tradition, are having to wrestle with that. Mm. And, and, and when I see a church make a positive decision and an uncomfortable decision to mm. actually say, I think that's done. And I think mm. we're going to do something else. That's brilliant. Mm. Or maybe they call a minister who's going to shake things up a bit. Yeah. You know, and you think, this is interesting. Mm. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. It's been a big moment, hasn't it, for us? I mean, I think obviously the pandemic is a big reset at every level for every church. And everyone's yeah. been asking how are we going to make it, uh, uh, how are we going to do mission and discipleship in a more sustainable way uh, in the context of post COVID? Uh, culture and society um, there's so many levels to that question but um, in relation to one of the conversations that we had I think was was around restarts wasn't it and and, and looking at what uh, what it looks like to build because essentially we're all going back to we're all going to be replanting our own churches when we go back into them oh, yeah. um, and that's what somebody said to me the other day and I thought yeah that's a great way of looking at it we're all church planters again now and um, in real terms, uh, as we go back into buildings, what does that look like? And some of us are really taking stock and saying, how do we, how do we do this? What is your, what, what do you see is, as happening in the London scene over the next five years? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that's a very, very good point, Phil. And, and I think a lot of us, actually don't know who's going to come back and, and, and I mean especially the, at the moment we're capacity wise we're restricted anyway mm. um, and we don't know when that's going to be relaxed um, I think yeah I mean as we go forward I think that, that, that there is going to be a process of reflection and recovery and I and we've been saying to pretty much all of our ministers and churches saying don't rush back to normal mm reflect you know what is god saying at this point you know is there something that we need to adjust mm. rather than just replicate and i do think that there is an opportunity here to do a to do a reset mm. um i do think over the next five years we're going to have to see a renewed interest in the out on people on the outside rather than on the inside mm. um you know, because our churches have been locked into a maintenance mode mm. for, for so long. And, mm. and, you know, I think the pandemic has almost accelerated time yes. faster than it would have done. It does that, doesn't it? It's compressed time. That's a really good way of saying it. I think that we are fast forwarded by at least um, 10 years, probably through yeah, the period of this pandemic in, te in cultural, in, in, in technological terms, um, we've, we've all had to either leap in onto that fast moving uh, um, uh, uh, conveyor belt or um, the, what the danger is, isn't it, is that we just become very small, isolated little groups. So I'm just, you know, I think that when you say, look, we've got 300 congregations here in the Baptist, we've got this incredible heritage. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to um I, I, to to um uh, to overcome that historic legacy and step into the new what's the what's the what's the overcoming uh, uh process in your mind well that that would vary from church to church i have to say you know i mean we're talking about our history here i mean you're ministering in camberwell only up the road is the metropolitan tabernacle who aren't in membership of the baptist union 
they're still in trust with us actually but they're not in membership mm. you know and we think of the legacy of charles spurgeon and, and all of the massive growth of church there mm. and, and i guess that if you were to say one sacrament that the baptists had it would be preaching mm. i mean that's what we're known of you know we're we're known for that mm. um i guess even going back 20 years when i was at college i was questioning that model mm -hmm. you know and new forms of church mm. different expressions of community mm. are are going to become ever more apparent because mm. most of what we do in church life even those of us maybe you and me and others who think that hey we're pretty lively you know i mean i had five organists in my first church wow <laughs> and it was like i turned up with my guitar and it was like what a noisy oik <laughs> You know, and they didn't think that of me, I know, and they're lovely people, mm. but it was very traditional in that model. And, and, mm. and we went through a stage of like, this is about the worship war. We're way past that now. And mm. sometimes we can think we're being contemporary and mm. relevant when we're not. Yes. And we're only yeah. actually speaking to the people who understand Christendom. Oh, yes. Because and when we think about life after Christendom, post Christendom, which is what we're in now, is that the entire edifice of which we built the churches on, that, that those presuppositions in society are largely going. Mm. Now, of course, London is different. Mm. We have people coming here from the global south and elsewhere that are bringing Christianity to London. I mean, reverse mission is a huge thing here anyway. Mm. But as we think about the people who, who have grown up here, be they white, black, whatever ethnicity, they, of course, view the world in a very different way now. Mm. And we have to adjust the way we communicate and do community mm. accordingly. Yes. And it is, it's interesting you say that the, the, the preaching is the sacrament of the, of the, of the Baptists. And just coming back to that, it is um, because the whole culture has moved from, a, uh, although classroom still has its place, doesn't it, in relation to the lecture or the idea of uh, a, a professor sharing something and even you know the popularity of ted talks and and uh, and and communications on that level and that platform they still have their place but they've taken yeah. their they've had to take their place alongside a whole load of other ways of learning and uh, and communicating and i just wonder you know where you know i uh, talking about this just the other day with the group and saying look, that there's the three ways that most people learn are either through the, in the classroom uh, in some form of apprenticeship or in some immersion experience and actually it's the immersion that is the most powerful way of learning anything because you know that's the way that children learn to talk for instance that's the way we don't know it's not nobody sits and teaches them um, until they get to kindergarten or you know when they're having to write or whatever but the, the, the way they learn is just by being around and being immersed and I find that yeah, that's right. I think there's there's a so part of what we're trying to do in REACH is help uh, people understand that immersion culture uh, and to, uh, to get to grips with, uh, with the apprenticeship model as well. It's pushing it, but still valuing the, 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 the preaching and understanding that role in terms of the craft of good communication. Do you think those three, uh, do you think that, that they're gonna take, uh, are, do, are people gonna feel that the, the, the preaching is, gonna, is just being displaced in the Baptists or is there... I don't think so no and, and I think one of the things that has been very interesting about the pandemic is of course we've moved online yeah and of course online time is different to in-person time mm. and generally I try and record a talk which will go out on someone's YouTube channel or on Facebook or whatever mm. and try and keep it to you know 11 minutes or thereabouts that has been a completely bizarre experience for us Baptists who love words. Mm. Now, normally I wouldn't be a long preacher. I, mm. I, I mean, I like to think I'm pretty brief. Mm. 25, 30 minutes, one person once said to me, I will give you 50 minutes. I said, I wouldn't dare, you know, in person. But the interesting thing with YouTube is you see people tuning out, don't you? You see the, yeah. the count going down and you think, <laughs> In person, you don't realise they're falling asleep. Yeah. On YouTube, they just log off. Yeah, and I think it, it, I, I did one sermon, actually, for my former church on, in lockdown. Yeah. I had to preach about the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit, and I had 10 minutes, right? <laughs> and I was given a passage from the Old Testament, 
I hadn't chosen it myself. I was allocated this. So I went, oh, cheers. So I did it. And one person who's a person I respect quite a lot, he's a barrister, he's moved away now. He mm. said, that's the best sermon you've ever preached. And I thought, I didn't think it was that good. And I swear it's because I was just shorter. And it makes you realise you can make them more of, more of the time. So time is compressed, quality over quantity. But what you're saying about those other points, I think, is very important. And in London Baptist, we have the internship programme now. We're in, in the wider Baptist, we're looking to develop that in a bigger sense trying to invest in people mentor people to encourage that in the local churches i mean being honest as i said to you at the start when i was at bible college if i hadn't done that second and third year placement in that church meeting in the school hall and rolling up my sleeves mm. i wouldn't have caught a vision for ministry no. because for me back in my home church albeit you know it was great mm. it was a, it was a didactic relationship like yeah. you know preach yeah. receive yeah, and I think that right. until you get stuck in mm. and actually, which is kind of see like, it. It, it, given that the Baptist tradition was formed out of the idea to be more egalitarian, isn't it, and uh, um, uh, and involved. I, I I hope the irony isn't lost on on some folk. Well, that's no, true. I mean, we only invented accredited ordained ministry mm. in the nineteen twenties. Oh wow! Because the then general secretary. Mm wanted us to be more like a proper denomination wow. and that has always and it from then till now there has always been this incredible tension mm. between the center mm. which is in, which is unnatural in baptist ecclesiology yes. and the local and in wow. fact even now if you were a fly on the wall with all of our national things it is always that 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 issue yeah. because we're a hybrid we're, we're not really a denomination in the same way as the Anglicans, mm. which have an Episcopal structure. Mm. OK, well, this is quite interesting kind of uh, nuance here, isn't it? And uh, an insight for those of us who are not completely on the Baptist page. But I think there is a it, 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 it is the challenge then for how do we move into the 21st century? Make sure we're because we are in the 21st century. We've got to be staking the ground and taking it forward haven't we from those centers of mission that you uh, are, are dotted around London I mean this is certainly my heart is how do we encourage and how do we uh, continue to to build the conversation for those who are saying yes we want to, not just to survive we want to thrive we want to be able to uh, expand what we're doing we want to see multiplication we want to see leaders like yourself having the opportunity to do something that gives them a taste and a flavour of what it looks like to be part of the ministry and um, and taking up that that call. Access routes, I think, leadership part. Tell me what you just, you know, we, we, we just some time, a little bit of time, but in terms of leadership pipelines, how do you see um, uh, new ministers coming in to leadership in the Baptist scene, Phil? Well, I mean, we... I mean, that, that is a very important thing for our, our, our family. Um, it is for, for every uh, church tradition. Um, I've mentioned our internship um, mm. efforts to see people come through that process. We have also a younger leaders group as well. So one of my colleagues pulls that together and that supports young leaders who might not be ordained or in senior church leadership so there might be a deacon or a leader in local church mm. you know to try and make them not feel so alone because mm. i think some people feel very isolated they could they might be the only one or two mm. sort of under 30 in their church mm. um, in fact when i meet a minister in their 20s i go thank the lord you're good you're young and old enough to be my son you know i'm old enough to be your dad you know because mm. i'm still perceived by some as quite young because I'm not in my 60s mm. which is dreadful so I do think um, an emphasis on that we have to focus on that we have to focus on youth children and families ministry more than ever even though during these cutback times people have actually been they're the first to get made redundant because we we go back to maintaining the chaplaincy mm. model of ministry which is looking after the faithful yeah it's important but actually we need to be investing. And I think that, that, that that's got to be a focus. Mm. I think we've also, in our sort of broader setting, 
have to try to encourage and support ministers who are coming into these situations mm. um, to, to, to handle change management. Um, mm. I mean, you and I have talked about the replanting thing. Uh, it requires an enormous amount of open handedness on the mm. part of the existing people in the church yeah. Yeah. to be willing to let go. But we've we've got to see more people let go mm. and to have those resources that we have, those historic resources, those legacies mm. set free for a ministry which is different today. Mm. And I think all of those things need to be of a piece. It's it's complicated. I, I tend to be not very prescriptive about it because I'm known as a bit of a wheeler dealer. OK. And um, retail background know, coming through. It is, it is that. And, and some people see me as moving the levers behind the scenes. And there is a bit about that because you, you want people to come together in the best possible way and for there to be a beautiful friendship, it's as just, it were. You want to you, you, yeah, you introduce people mm. um, so that things happen. Mm. And, and that's when it, that gives me my greatest mm. buzz. You know, when I see something happened that was unexpected mm. that actually it works and as but i say to people who are looking for ministers it only takes one yes. it doesn't take 10 applicants it takes one yes and i think that you know as we to say about that phil that i think that's a gift for the time you know in terms of people yeah. getting people together who need to have the right conversations is yeah. for me uh, in my uh, opinion uh one of the key gifts that is needed in this season in this culture because we are uh you know the whole all the pressures are to silo just to preserve and protect to um uh, and that limits your exposure and conversations but if you can get people of peace together then things happen like you say and and, it, and that for me is, is really a key spiritual ministry and gift and i think uh so, you know, wheeler, wheel, wheeler and dealer away, my friend. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's, it's... No, it's true, because every every situation is different. Yes. Every single one of yeah. our churches have different challenges, although there are often variations on a the theme. Mm. I mean, at the end of the day, oh, our yeah. churches are aging mm. and need to find new ways of leadership. But mm. how that is expressed locally is always very different. Mm. You know, it so. really, and it's a relational journey, isn't it? I mean, that's the bottom line for every every place. There is no model you can impose. I did a recent um, discussion with Mark Job. You probably saw it on Restarts. That um, uh, because they they so, they've done a, a wonderful job of honouring the previous generations in the in the churches in which they've helped to renew. And uh, and bring fresh life to over in Chicago. Um, I'll put a link in this, the bottom of this talk to that talk. But I think one of the keys for me is how do we honour and build those bridges with relationship, with 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 genuine relationship and sensitivity that, that people don't just feel like they're um, you know they're they're on the way out. <laughs> but I mean we're all on the way. We're, we're all on the way out. But we it's kind of like working on. Yeah. What, what's our legacy? No, no. Yeah, exactly. That's true. I mean, yes, we do need sensitivity, but I guess in my world, and this is an uncomfortable truth, it is very difficult to see change in some of these situations, and it's often painful. Mm -hmm. and, and you hope and pray and pray and pray and pray for openness. So maybe just so. over land this, Phil, I just wondered, you know, what would you... Um... You know, if you were to, if I was to ask you, what would be the best possible scenario? I mean, the 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 difficult scenario is obviously that the church ages and that a whole denomination just disappears quietly into the sunset, um, and is no more. But in a in a different, more hopeful scenario, what would you say? What would you love to see happen? I guess. Um... Again, without being too prescriptive about every single one of our situations, mm -hmm. there will be some churches that close. It will. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but, you know, those resources can be sometimes, not always, recycled for mission and ministry. So that, that's okay. We need a redeployment, mm -hmm. I'd say, in, in some respect. 
What would I like to see happen? I guess really what I want to see are new communities embedded where they are <clears throat> in the local community, mm. not drive to churches, certainly not attractional church where all Christians just pool together and don't live there. Mm. But churches that are real, um, churches that are engaged with questions of justice and engagement around the local community, because mm. that is really where the, the rubber hits the road in today's culture. You know, we, mm. you know, we know that faith without works is, 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 is worthless. But actually nowadays, unless you've got something to show, mm. people aren't necessarily going to listen to you. So, you know, so for us to have credibility in the local communities, I know we talk about community organising, all sorts of things like that, mm. innovative, lightweight, mm. you know, I think that bivocational ministry is probably the future. Yes. yes. Uh, and us making our, our, our resources, our historic resources, useful for today's expression of church. And that might mean church in all short, sorts of shapes. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, where, where are people on a Sunday? They're at Ikea, you mm. know, or they're, they're playing football in the park. You know, it's funny in this job, because I don't have a church to run anymore. Occasionally, I don't, I don't have to go to church. I mean, I do. I just want you to know that. But, you know, you could go somewhere and go, oh, so that's where everyone is. <laughs> you know, and of course we know that, but it, it's, it's finding other, other mm. avenues. And I think that I would encourage people to listen to God in their local area and to pray. And this is what the Baptists are about, discerning mm. what the mind of Christ is for this community mm. and, 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 what, what and doing. looking yeah. for yeah. something new. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Great. Phil, it's, thank you so much for talking to me. And I'm really appreciated hearing and finding a little bit more about your history and story. And the Baptist story, and um, hopefully this will be a blessing to some of our folk. Just to remind um, uh, the uh, folk who are listening that uh, these resonate chats go online uh, with fair kind of irregularity. So just if you subscribe, then you'll get to know when the next one is coming up. But we're uh, we're trying to keep a steady flow of of, of uh, exposure to leaders in London. And uh, what is it that God's saying and doing as we move forward in mission and discipleship? Phil, thanks again so much for, for sharing. It's great to see you. And keep going, my friend. Keep wheeling and dealing. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Bless you. Bye. Bye.